also known as the fable that should have stayed lost. At nearly 24 minutes, excluding intro and credits, this is the longest chapter of Ruby ever produced. And when this came out, Kruby really wanted to emphasize how much of an undertaking this was. But even with all the asset creation, unique set design, and clear effort the animators were made to put into just this one episode, something about the lost fable never sat right with me. I walked away feeling... nothing. Not even in that way where a piece of media leaves you numb and lost, and you know that was the intent. I just felt... empty. Unaffected. The grand story we'd been building up to for six seasons, ever since 2013, turned out to be so... shallow. I mentioned in my recent Making Peace with Ruby video how I was high off toxic positivity at the time. I let my perceptions and thoughts of the show be warped so that I could continue to enjoy it, when in my gut I knew I wasn't happy with what we got. I even convinced myself it was okay that this episode left me disappointed, because it was my own fault for expecting too much, and it's okay if the show doesn't want to tell a compelling story with rich themes. But the thing is, I don't believe any of that. A story that sits on such a storytelling goldmine that has the potential to explore complex themes of what it means to be human, what it means to be alive, and refuses to, isn't a story worth twisting yourself in knots over. That all said, if you did enjoy The Lost Fable or you enjoy Modern Ruby, this isn't to shame you or insult you in any way. I'm glad that you're able to enjoy it. However, I should also be allowed to express my own disappointments. Now you might be wondering why it's given me such problems. It functions just fine as an origin story for Remnant, Ozpin, and Salem. And that's the thing. On a superficial level, it functions, somewhat. It gives you the appearance of a story in which the world became a remnant of its former glory, caused by Salem's arrogance which will go on to torment Ozpin through all his lifetimes. But if you look a bit deeper at any part of this episode, it quickly falls apart. There's nothing here but the illusion of an epic fairy tale, and if you even squint your eyes just a bit, you see through the mist to find Miles and Carrie telling the animators to spend all-nighters with no overtime pay, rendering this out for the fans. Our vice president would be like, and remember, uh, Monday is like Memorial Day, whatever, so everybody has that off, and then you just hear animation department go, ah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that, that really helps a team is when you rem like remind people, it's like, hey, I know you're tired, and I know you want to go home, and I know it seems like you've been here forever, but the th all this time and energy is impacting people literally all around the world. So here we are. We're gonna go in depth as to why the Lost Fable doesn't work on any level. And to begin our journey, a tale of why Ruby is kind of fucked to begin with. Before we dive into the specifics of this cursed folktale, first we need to establish the core issues of the show as a whole, because they all play into why this story just doesn't work beyond the bare minimum. Salem is the catalyst for the Lost Fables plot. She's the one who instigates conflict with the gods, leading to the end of the world, and eventually becomes the big bad we're dealing with in the present. That's why our story begins with her as a lonely girl locked in a lonely tower by her cruel father. At least, Jin says he's cruel. Locked away by her cruel father. I think he's cruel, because we never met the man. And it's here we start running into our problems. Ruby has always struggled with its obsession with mystery and withholding information to keep fans guessing and coming back for answers. The issue here, however, is that storytelling relies on prioritizing what information to give the audience so that they understand the conflicts and can get invested, versus what to hold off on until later. And oftentimes, novice writers will withhold far too much, giving their audience little to nothing to get them hooked in the present. That's part of the reason it's so frustrating we were made to wait six whole seasons for basic information about the main conflict of the series. And I do mean basic. This entire chapter feels like the bare bones summary of plot points all crammed into as short a chapter as possible. This may be one of the longest chapters of the series, 
but within the context of what it's trying to establish, it feels rushed trying to breeze through so much information with so little time to explore anything meaningfully. The Lost Fable would be better served as a two or three parter, or maybe even a whole volume to itself given volumes structurally are basically extended movies rather than full seasons. Even then, it would have been best if some of the information here had been shared before this to give us anchor points to work with. Because we don't have the time to properly delve into anything going on, we basically get a Sparknotes edition of Remnant's origin story. We don't get to know the characters fully, we don't know who they are, where they come from, what their motivations are, nor why they have these motivations. Rather, characters are treated as vehicles for plot progression, with surface level character work to leave the audience to fill in the gaps that the writers left in. It's part of the reason so many people walk away with aggressively different interpretations of the entire show and its characters. Because clarity has never been a priority for Ruby. With this show, you don't really get a story. You get the illusion of a story probably induced by inhaling Jin's obnoxious smoke clouds. Salem is probably the best example of all of this. We're told she's locked away in a tower by her cruel father, as Jin says. By her cruel father. We're using Jin as a narrator to tell us the basics of the story so that we have an easy jumping off point. Okay, nothing inherently wrong with using a narrator for these sorts of things. The issue is we're not grounded enough in what's going on to get a full understanding of the context, leaving viewers to do guesswork themselves to follow what's happening. Most people would probably assume Salem's father is abusive or maybe overprotective, and that's why he stuck her here against her will. However, someone could also say he's just an evil man who wants to keep his family as possessions, or maybe he's a cynical recluse and keeps Salem around as the only form of human connection he deems worthwhile. Because we don't have the information as to why Salem is being kept here and what her father's motivation is, we can't fully be invested in the story because we're actively wondering what his motivation is. Rather than being immersed in the emotional beats of Salem's captivity and liberation, we're stuck in theory brain mode crafting narratives based on what we would prefer to see in the story, which in turn are based on our own biases, likely from whatever media knowledge that we're working from. And to make matters more frustrating, they go more into detail about Salem's story in the fairy tale book, which tells stories from all across Remnant. But this is another issue Ruby has always struggled with, using supplemental content as a crutch to make up for its own failures in storytelling. The purpose of supplemental content is to add value to a work that's already complete and of merit. That's what supplemental literally means. Ideally, you get a finished product you can enjoy, and if you really love it and want more, supplemental material lets you immerse yourself even further than most casual audiences would bother with. Ruby, however, knows of its shortcomings in conveying information, and rather than trying to fix it, instead uses supplemental content as both a quick fix and a shield. This way, they can just say, all your unanswered questions are in this fairy tale book or this canonical novel. The problem is that you shouldn't need supplemental content in order to complete your understanding of a work. That is not what supplementing is. Not to mention, the purpose of storytelling is to captivate your audience by, well, telling them a good story. And that story needs to be finished and polished. When you buy any product, let's say a computer for example, you'd expect it to be finished right out of the box, right? But what if the company you bought it from said you needed all these additional pieces of hardware so it could perform basic functions, like connect to the internet, or play movies and music, or just not crash every five seconds? Pardon me for my lack of computer knowledge, but that's not the point. The point is that a product needs to be complete for customer satisfaction. And as much as I dislike the commodification of art, that still holds true on a storytelling level. Your audience should be able to kick back, relax, and enjoy your story in all its glory. The work comes from you, the storytelling, crafting your work for the enjoyment of others. Making them do the work on their own, just so that they can understand what's going on, not only risks them losing interest, but is a betrayal of what it means to share a story in the first place. And this isn't the same as holding your audience's hand aggressively and beating them over the head with what you're trying to say. Telling a subtle but coherent story is vastly different from telling a story where your audience literally has to Google basic things like your world building, your character motivations, so on and so forth. I liken it to puzzles. 
Telling a good story is like providing your audience with a puzzle, and the more complex your story is, the more subtle, the more pieces are scattered about. Your story is the picture of the puzzle that guides the audience to piecing it together to give them satisfaction, but you're still doing a bulk of the work to give them the information they need within the text itself. The Ruby approach, meanwhile, entails giving your audience a very blurred, low-res image of your finished puzzle, and then chucking the puzzle pieces at their face. And oh no, now they're all over the floor. Some pieces are broken, some are chipped or soggy, and some are just plain missing, forcing the audience to literally construct their own pieces in some hopeless, desperate bid to understand what the fuck kind of paradise would be worth all this torment. Except the end paradise isn't a paradise. It's the lost fable, so... No thanks. I'll just burn the pieces I was provided with and go watch Girlfriends on Netflix. Oh, hell no! That's also not counting all the pieces that are in extra sets that will cost you $10 extra. I mentioned Salem because she's the prime example of this fundamental failure. The text itself fails to give us a clear image of her background, why she's in the tower, and her most basic motivations and flaws. And as such, we're given the illusion of a story that winds up becoming distorted based on our own expectations and desires. It's the same with Ozma, it's the same with the gods, and it's the same with pretty much everything else on the show. Ultimately, Ruby isn't even really its own story, but a hollow imitation of other stories. There's a huge difference between taking inspiration from other stories and artists you admire to create your own thing versus mimicry. So much great art was inspired by other art that the creator enjoyed. For instance, Taylor writing Death by a Thousand Cuts because she loved something great on Netflix. Oh my God, how is this woman real? And skilled writers know that tropes aren't something to be avoided, Actually, they can't be avoided because that's not how this works. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. But rather, tropes are building blocks to be played with to tell a story that they may want to see more of in the world. Ruby, meanwhile, was never given enough time in the oven, nor handed to writers capable of bringing that original vision to life, and as such, has stumbled trying to become something other than itself since its premiere. The Lost Fable really serves as a microcosm of all the show's problems. It's every minor problem in plot, pacing, character writing, and everything else all boiled down into a 26 minute experience of overwhelming ambivalence. That's probably part of the reason why it fucked me up so much when I first saw it. It's the culmination of Ruby's shortcomings that I wanted to believe they could grow past. But they had six volumes to do that. And this was proof that they never would. I couldn't admit that at the time, but now I can. And now, with our full understanding of Ruby's problems, we can finally talk about the details of the Lost Fable and why it's such a shallow, vacuous mess that says nothing. So as we've established, the Lost Fable doesn't tell us why Salem's father has locked her away from the world. We get no information beyond him being cruel. But you can be cruel for many reasons, and in different ways. Maybe it's a cruel overprotectiveness, doubting the good in the world in Salem's ability to fend for herself. Or maybe it's just a malicious enjoyment of her misery, a way for her father to exert control over someone else. The reason why this all matters is because his motivation, or lack thereof, directly feeds into Salem's motivation. It explains the environment that she's growing up in, how she's been raised, and how all of that paints her own picture of the world. We're told Salem dreams of freedom, but why? Does she just earnestly want to see the world and want more? Or does she have an ulterior motive, some goal to pursue once she's out? Maybe she wants to learn more about her parents before they built this tower, or what happened to her mother. You know, the one we only know about from the goddamn fairy tale book. Do you have daddy issues? I don't even have a mom. Neither do we. Maybe she wants to spite her father and live recklessly, or see whether he's right about the world's dangers, or even go full conquest mode and become a bigger tyrant than he ever was. If he was. Oh god. Maybe she's always shown malicious tendencies for whatever reason. Why? It's the question on everybody's mind, isn't it? I wish I had an answer. And her father is trying to keep not only her safe, but the world at large from her. Some people struggle not to be drawn into the darkness. Ever since I was a little girl, I said, why not splash in and have fun? We don't know. 
Do you see how quickly this lack of information spirals? Any one of these stories can be engaging on its own, but because we're not given any context, we're not able to understand anyone's motivations and follow their journeys with full investment. Maybe some people think Salem just doesn't have people skills and that's why she doesn't know how to grieve later on. Or maybe some people just think she was manipulative from the start because of her upbringing and it was only a matter of time. That ambiguity isn't from a well-crafted story, but rather a lack of storytelling from the writers who are paid and credited for their work here. And on top of that, why doesn't Salem just bust out of her tower from the start? We're told everyone here has magic, so what's stopping Salem from using that magic to take down her father, then get the hell out? or just fly out her fucking window. An easy critique is that her, her cruel, cruel father, father probably has mentally abused her into staying, which is all too common among victims of all kinds of abuse. However, it doesn't quite work here because again, we don't have the context of Salem's imprisonment. Without the full details of the situation, we're left to guess why she hasn't tried leaving, whether it be legit fears of fleeing her captor or just plain lazy writing while she waits for her hero. The fairy tale book mentions her throwing letters from her window, beckoning heroes to come and save her. It even suggests that this shows her manipulative tendencies and her ability to craft a narrative from day one. But this is literally just her asking for help. Never mind, it's not in the show itself, but even if it were, this wouldn't even work the way the writers intended if it played out the way it does in the book. Her father is said to be more overprotective and sympathetic in the fairy tale book, thus villainizing Salem. But it honestly feels more like a retcon the writers came up with to make Salem look worse in hindsight, almost like propaganda. And again, it's not even in the show, so it's irrelevant. Her whirlwind romance with Ozma likewise falls flat. We'll get to Ozma a bit later, but we're led to believe the two fell deeply in love after her rescue because Jin told us. The two fell deeply in love. Sure, Jan. You could argue that's meant to make fun of the tired cliche of love at first sight we've seen in fairy tales or how people fall in love and get married in like three days. But usually in those old stories, they actually do a good job of portraying that the circumstances did indeed make them fall in love, or at the very least, that they're infatuated with each other. And also, it's a fairy tale, it's not meant to be realistic, but I digress. But none of that happens with Salem and Ozma. Instead, some random guy comes to save the boring lady from her pointless tower, and then they hold hands and he dies. Wow, what a tragedy indeed. Even if this were a parody or satire, it would still bore me to sleep. Salem's connection with Ozma is what's supposed to cause her to lash out at the gods, demanding his return. So like Salem's father's motivation in forming hers, the lack of a meaningful bond between Salem and Ozma robs this conflict of all its potency. It's basically like the domino effect. The writers fail to properly establish one thing, and the rest of their writing collapses in a series of crashes and dumpster fires. It even goes back to her own motivation for seeing the world. This and her romance with Ozma should work together to inform why she demands his death be reversed. Is it a simple flaw of her arrogance? Wanting Ozma back in her possession and not caring about death? Or does she simply not understand what death is? Without these crucial pieces, we can't understand what she's going through or why she does these things, and therefore, the story doesn't work. All of this feels like common problems of a first draft, where the goal is just to get the story out in its most raw, most basic form before refining it prior to publication. But knowing Ruby's production timeline, where volumes are cranked out in less than a year, and chapters are rendered and exported within the same week as their release, I very much doubt the show's scripts get more than one or two drafts before they're shoved down the pipeline for the poor animators to work tirelessly on, trying to give some life to a project that's dead on arrival. So we have no clue if Salem even understands death nor why she wants Ozma back, but damn it, she wants him back. And here we reach yet another divide at which people will argue whether she's pitiful or contemptible, lost or selfish. Don't worry, there's plenty more folks in the road for the writers to hard break at. You're not walking away without at least some degree of whiplash. Through the dark forest we drive, and no matter which road we take, all paths lead to the ravine of despair. 
which weirdly does make an appearance at the end of volume 8, but I digress. So once she's given the immortality by the gods, they claim it's a punishment. She won't be able to enter the afterlife to reunite with Ozma until she understands the balance of life and death. You must learn the importance of life and death. Only then may you rest. On its own, I actually really love this. It asserts the fragility of life that must be respected and cherished. Immortality isn't a blessing, but a curse, never letting you rest and guaranteeing that even if you do make new connections, you'll be forced to watch them grow old and die over and over until you relent and choose isolation. And even if you don't, humanity will eventually die out. And then when the world is barren, when your kind has gone extinct, you'll still be wandering the waste for all time alone. Unfortunately, I don't think the writers actually thought that one through. It doesn't even really work given Salem wasn't established to have this fear of death or defiance of death. This is a classic need versus want. Your character wants something external, but they need something internal. In Salem's case, she wants her fairy tale romance with Ozma, but what she needs is to understand how life works and accept it. Along with some therapy. I don't know if they have therapy in ancient times, but yeah, apparently they don't have doctors, so good luck, girl, good luck. But we don't know her want, nor her need. I'm not even sure the writers thought that far ahead. So now we have an amorphous character whose wants and needs aren't clearly defined, thus failing to give the audience anything concrete to latch onto. She winds up quote unquote manipulating the human kingdoms to turn on the gods, but it doesn't really mean all that much. She talks about people not having to watch their loved ones die anymore, which would be interesting to explore given all living things are born with an inherent fear of death. Survival drives us to build communities and protect ourselves and each other, but it can also lead us to destroying anything perceived as a threat. Even ignoring death can have astronomical consequences if you do it your whole life. But Salem's words aren't shown as ones that ring true for mankind. Instead, Jin's tone, the framing, and the music all suggest that this is mere manipulation and the humans mere fools. That Salem's giving these people lofty promises to turn them against the gods who crafted a perfect world for them and she doesn't mean a damn thing. But all these problems have applied to this supposed utopia as well, along with the brother gods, which who will get to them, don't you worry. But it's not even portrayed as a morally gray situation where everyone's a bit in the wrong and failing to communicate, thus breeding conflict. Instead, it's a clumsy conflict that doesn't think as to whether Salem has a point, nor whether the gods themselves may be at fault for the way that they handle things. They're gods after all, and gods be infallible, her da der 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 Yes, I know Jin says that Salem realizes they're fallible, but the show never bothers to do anything substantial with that outside of her scheme. Like, you don't really have the gods questioning their morals or their choices, they just kinda assume that they're always right. And the story also just assumes that they're correct, so that's great. Salem winds up being left alone, which I guess makes her sad. Jin says she blamed everyone but herself, but once again, I must repeat that the failure to establish her motivations and character beyond superficial, I want my dead boyfriend back, has left us, much like Salem, wandering the darkness looking for some kind of reason for our suffering, for some divine answer. But all we're greeted with is despair and also a creepy grim pool of ichor to dive headfirst into. On a story and thematic level, Salem falling into the grim pool when she's alone is great, and I mean that sincerely. On a plot level, it explains why she's part grim later on, but more importantly, on a character level, it's the moment she gives in to her darkest impulses and commits to being a monster. And on a thematic level, it represents how isolation imposed by your own failings and misdeeds can turn you into something much darker how those vices can twist you into something else entirely. But again, this is me constructing an entire story myself, because the show couldn't be bothered to tell a complete story of its own. After this, we don't see her again until her reunion with Ozma. Supposedly, she's built a little cottage for herself, living alone in the woods, far away from the newly evolved people who fear her as a witch. Side note, oh my god, mood girl. I vibe with this gothic cottage core aesthetic. Put some folklore and evermore on and sign me the fuck up. But we have no clue what this has done to her either than make her hate the gods more, which, yeah, same though. But then she suggests a full-on conquest with Ozma where they guide the poor lost humans. We could become the gods of this world. We can mold these lands into whatever we want, what you want. Again, the framing here suggests that she's evil, but 
Why? The hearts of men are easily swayed. What about her plan is evil? Hell, the show doesn't even really explain her plan all that much. She seems to want to take the god's place and create a paradise, but the writing keeps this undercurrent of treachery and malice going the whole way without anything to really back it up. Like, Salem's encouraging Ozma to help her build themselves a little kingdom to give some order to this ruined world. What about this is inherently evil? If they were commanding Grimm to slaughter people, targeting marginalized groups like the Faunus, or just taking away people's most basic liberties and property, then yeah, I'd agree there's poison in the water. But none of that happens. The only evidence of her evil is her and Ozma's assumed army waging war, and her talking about fighting and destroying their opposition to spread their word. Are we sure this is right? You said we needed to bring humanity together. In order to do that, we have to spread our word and destroy those who will deny it. But that's something literally every country on the planet and nearly every religion has done. It's just standard fare when you're building a nation. Like that's not Dark Lord shit, that's just regular people shit. Then later on, when Ozma tells her about the God of Light's mission, Salem says it doesn't matter. Her exact words are, why spend our lives trying to redeem these humans when we can replace them with what they could never be? I've heard people try to argue she's referring to replacing the gods, as she stated earlier, but that doesn't grammatically track. And also it would be redundant because it means her motivations haven't changed versus this scene trying to imply Salem somehow taking a turn for the worse. The object Salem is referring to in that sentence is these humans. As such, the them in the second clause is still the subject from the first clause, these humans. I didn't expect to have to explain basic grammar rules, but here we are. So she wants to replace the humans. The reason this kind of makes sense is because in the previous scene, we saw their nameless daughter, we'll talk about the daughters eventually, relax, showing off her newfound magic. Because Salem and Ozma have magic, their children have magic too. Simple enough. So now the obvious assumption would be that Salem finds the current humanity worthless because they've lost the ability to perform magic. Thus, it would make sense that her goal would be to wipe them out and then replace them all with sorcerers, similar to the way the old world worked. Just replace the brother gods with herself and Ozma. But the show doesn't really commit to that. It doesn't explain it and make that obvious. And thus her plan, like her motivations, is still as cloudy as Jin's lantern fumes. At this point, you basically have to guess it's just to spite the gods and nothing else, even though volume eight winds up throwing that in the trash. All she craves now is release, death. But that's for another time. And this is where her original motivation comes to bite the writers in the ass. Without that, there's nothing to inform how she's changed, thus allowing us to understand her better as a villain. If she has a fear of death, then maybe she wants to make everyone immortal like her. Plenty of animes and RPGs do that, where you wipe out the humanity that already exists in favor of an ideal that's easier for you to stomach, like replicas or lifeless beings or emotionless husks. Hello, Tales Games, how are you today? But this is all just speculation. Nothing in the text points to this, because the text itself doesn't point to anything but an obscure destination of Sayla Bad, she must be stopped. What would have been interesting to see would be that fear of death twisting her into something monstrous. Like, maybe she has this moment of realizing because of her immortality, she's going to watch Ozma grow old and die over and over as he reincarnates, and left with large chunks of time where he's lost to her. And worse than that, a realization that because their daughters are mortal, they'll die and just never come back. And maybe Salem can't handle that. Maybe that fear of losing connection drives her to scorn it altogether, leading her to detach, which fuels the last straw before she kills them all in cold blood. But nah, she just kills them because Ozma didn't want to do conquest with her anymore. So Salem is a fucking mess. She's nothing more than a device for conflict that the writers can throw at the heroes and go, wow, isn't she scary? Isn't she powerful? Isn't she a mad woman? And I can't wait to watch you burn. 
she is the embodiment of this show's inability to tell a coherent story that knows how to establish context, and convey a worthwhile character arc in favor of the illusion of something deep. And in reality, that profoundness is actually about as deep as a dried up puddle in the middle of the Nevada desert. So I can't even throw myself into the Icker pool right after her. Wonderful. And now we move on to Ozma. Poor, characterless, motivationless, and agency-less Ozma. Look, we were on a roll, just go with it. But Ozma's kind of the inverse of Salem. Whereas her character writing was unclear in which direction the writers wanted to go in, Ozma's just has no direction. He exists solely as an aimless object of Salem's desire to superficially explain her actions and then to oppose her later on when they decide she's the bad guy. Oh, and also so the main characters can abuse him and Oscar later on, but we'll get there, good lord. Like Salem, we don't have enough information about Ozma to understand him as a character from the onset. Who he is, what's his background, what's his motivation, etc. Except while we at least knew Salem's father was vaguely cruel and locked her in a tower, all we've got about Ozma is that he's supposedly a hero and he's quite popular. That's it. Well, also that he's pretty, but that just goes without saying, like, goddamn. Wait, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, the bad writing, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, excuse me, excuse me being gay. So we have no clue where Ozma is from and no clue as to his motivations. He's a hero, sure, but why? What made him decide he wants to help people? Does he travel around the world like a drifter, maybe even as a thrill seeker? Does he take mercenary jobs? Does he fight dark lords or rogue monsters? Is he righteous or possibly self-serving? Nothing. We get nothing but a vaguely do-gooding, pretty blank slate. No motivation, just sure, let's free Salem from this stupid tower because the script says so. We're not even really sure of what his abilities are beyond the general magical abilities everyone has, which... Oh god, the magic in this show is so boring. It robs us of how the dynamic with Salem would play out, thus preventing the audience from becoming fully invested in either of them as characters, as well as their relationship. And that's especially a mistake because the loss of that relationship is what's meant to inform Salem's supposed descent into villainy. And just touching on the death briefly, a single sickness prevailed? What? Okay, okay, I will admit, I kind of like the simplicity of this in theory. It shows how death can be unexpected and come from the most basic things. But also, this is some bullshit. You're telling me that this healthy young man who's fit enough to travel the lands adventuring was taken down by the common cold, I guess? How? Y'all have magic, but you don't have healers or even doctors? And also, isn't this meant to be a utopia filled with prosperity protected by the gods? Sure, people can still get sick and die, but a little cold shouldn't be able to take out a person so presumably young and healthy. You'd expect that from a time, period, an environment lacking in quality healthcare and medicine, or something like a serious disease or even plague. Which, I mean, if it was that, they would have established that in the text, right? Like, I don't know, isn't this something you would expect more from a hellish wasteland, like, I don't know, Remnant? Not the utopia that Remnant once was? Maybe even a disease wrought by one of the gods to fuel Salem's hatred of them. But, Nah, nah, that would require too much thought and nuance to fully write out. So Ozma just dies because he needs to die for Salem. And thankfully Salem doesn't have much to clean up given he just poofs away in a cloud of gin smoke. You'd think the death of such a well-respected beloved hero would garner more attention from the public and we could see how Salem deals with that. And how in turn that displays her true character. Like maybe she shuns the community that Ozma once loved and served. But Let's be real, when has the show ever cared about building a believable world that feels lived in? The next we see of Ozma is him getting yo-yoed between the realms of life and death by the brother gods throwing a goddamn tantrum. I see... <gasps> a Ozma! Yes! I see a... Ozma! It is under the sofa. Like, this poor man just died, and now he's being brought back to life without his knowledge in the domain of the Dark Lord, only for the God of Light to kill him again, to which the God of Darkness immediately brings him back before killing him in a plume of hellfire. He has no agency in any of this, and no real say beyond vague confusion, nor does he bring this up later on and ask Salem, what was up with that? It's literally just to, well, I'd say traumatize Salem, but... 
honestly. I have no clue what the hell they were trying to do with her character at this point. And they somehow managed to make Ozma's horror both laughable and memeable, which... Impressive, guys. Wow. You know, if your goal was to make me, you know, think Salem was awful for going against the gods, you kind of failed because she's right. They're monsters. They suck. Everyone sucks. It brings into question the morality of the gods and whether they actually respect human life the way they claim Salem doesn't. But again, saving it for later. But on the note of the gods, it's the god of light who asks Ozma whether he wants to go back to his world for... reasons? Even the goddamn gods don't have a coherent motivation. Dude, didn't you just give up on Remnant? Why bother bringing Ozma back and throwing him headfirst into an eternity of suffering in a ruined world you abandoned? And if I'm dead to you, why are you at the wake? <laughs> but even beyond that, this is one of the few times Ozma has any kind of agency, but it's rendered hollow by the fact he's had none of it leading up to this moment, and he and Salem's relationship has proven more stale than moldy bread. And when he's sent back to Remnant, it's... as some white-haired dude? He doesn't even have a name of his own. The Oz carnations are designed in such a way where when the current Oz dies, his soul is randomly assigned to another young man who becomes the host, and eventually their souls become one, but they're also kind of... mind roommates. Travel down the road and back again. However, this isn't Ozma hopping into some random guy's head and having to talk to him the way that Ozpin had to convince Oscar to go save the world. This is just straight up possession. This guy presumably already had a life of his own given he's in the middle of defending himself from the Grim when Ozma awakens and first looks through his eyes. Which is... odd, given one of the villagers doesn't even know who he is when Ozma saves him. Thank you. Please, tell me your name. Who are you? And the argument of this person just coming into being now doesn't make sense because why in the fuck was he created to be killing a Grim with farming equipment right out the gate? And why right next to some random burning village? The show tries so hard to appear deep and tragic with the whole concept of the Oz Carnations, and this fear that Oscar is going to lose himself one day, and it's out of both he and Ozpin's control. But it never actually feels engaging, mostly because it's never explored in what this means for either character, nor does it feel like something that the writers are interested in beyond, wow, look at how tragic these characters' story is. And this is proof of it. In the origin story, we don't even see Ozma having to struggle with sharing a body with this random guy, see them bond, and watch that possession slowly progress as the chapter goes on. No, that would take too long and be inconvenient to write in. So Ozma just straight up body hops. Oscar is disturbed by it, and then we never address it again. He later runs into Salem and, my god, this reunion is so underwhelming. If you were separated from your one true love for literal eons after enduring indescribable trauma and hardship, and then suddenly in this new world you managed to find each other again, what would you do? Wouldn't you be speechless or maybe run up to them to hug them while crying your eyes out? But neither of them do that. All they do is slowly amble towards each other, hold hands awkwardly, and then go, Lo, what do we do? I mean, I kind of get that from Ozma, given the warning he got from the God of Light, and especially Salem's current appearance as a grim witch. Not to mention all the things that the people have been saying about her for... some reason. Reputation precedes me, they told you I'm crazy, I swear I don't love the drama, it loves me. But maybe Salem is beside herself with relief and joy and is crying her eyes out, and it makes Ozma suppress his doubts. And we get... nothing! Yay. I swear, this feels less like I'm watching characters struggle and face tragedy, and more like I'm having wiki page summaries narrated to me by a gender-bent version of Genie from Aladdin subjected to Rule 34. So later on, Ozma has this realization that violence is wrong and conquest bad, which causes him to reveal to Salem the mission the God of Light stuck him with. Again, no clue why Salem's a bad guy here when she's just doing what literally every leader of a young nation does, but... Okay, sure, alright. But he decides she's now too far gone because clearly that's the conclusion the writers want us to have arrived at. They never bothered giving us a good reason for it, nor actually leading us there competently, but they... tried, I guess? I'm not even sure about that, but I'm tired, so we'll just say that they did that for the sake of my own sanity. There is actually a deleted scene, presumably from this chapter, that was shown off in the Volume 6 trailer, which shows the reborn Ozma floating before a bunch of presumed followers bowing in fear before him. That was probably going to be another moment to establish Ozma's cementing distrust of Salem, but was cut for... 
reasons. This happens all the time with the show. Because chapters are finished last minute, certain things will be abruptly cut for the sake of getting them out on time, even if they may seem vital to whatever botched story the writers attempted at telling. This even happened recently with Volume 8. I won't talk about it for too long, but Volume 8 hinges around Salem laying siege to one of the Four Kingdoms and the main characters having to face her. Well, actually, only one of them interacts with her, and even then, it's only for two seconds before they explode her five episodes before the actual finale. Now, I don't know why she wasn't the final boss of the season either, but Ruby and Blake were initially meant to go to the Hell Whale, yes, her wartime lair for traveling as a demon monster, just go with it, it'll make life easier for both of us, to go fight Salem before she exploded. That, however, was cut for time. At least, that's what the writers admitted to at a panel. They'll share tons of information like that outside the actual show, and yes, it's infuriating. Some will argue that this was because of the ice storm, which battered Texas earlier this year, but that chapter was actually the last one released before said ice storm hit, and was also the second chapter back after a six-week mid-volume hiatus, during which the team was presumably working on the volume. Or were they? <laughs> I don't know. All I know is the fact that the animators were expected to crank out a new volume, as usual, in the midst of a pandemic, because this is the only thing that's making RT money at the moment and they desperately need it, all while still enduring awful working conditions, which is just hideous. I'll probably go more into this if I make a video about Volume 8 specifically, but suffice to say, fuck Rooster Teeth, just fuck them, and God help the employees. Corporations aren't your friend, they don't care about doing the right thing, they care about money. That's what the system requires. Anyhow, Ozma tries to get himself and his daughters away from Salem, only for her to viciously slaughter them all. Yes, all of them. Even their daughters, who had no clue what the hell was even going on. Before Ozma can say a word, Salem incinerates him on the spot, and then he continues to reincarnate, still processing his trauma, before realizing he has to defeat and destroy his former lover in order to accomplish the mission he got from the God of Light. Why is he still so gung-ho on this mission? Your guess is as good as mine, but I suspect the answer is the same as to why he got Salem out of the tower. He's a vaguely do-gooding blank slate, who is slightly less pretty now. And then when he asks Jin how to destroy Salem, he gets this. You can't. Thus, he falls into despair and has to lie to his future followers so that he can continue the fight. First of all, what an oddly phrased question to ask. How do I destroy Salem? Like, it makes sense, but... Wouldn't you expect something like, how do I defeat Salem, or how do I stop Salem? Destruction specifically feels convenient so that the writers can strip him, the characters, and the audience of hope and leave them shocked. But it rings so hollow. Mostly because this entire chapter is hollow. But also because the scenario is obviously an obnoxious red herring, and incredibly contrived. And all that aside, the characters are still convinced Ozma is a villain. This honestly deserves its own section, which will be our final talking point of this terrible evening, but Ozma is so clearly a victim, both in the actual story of both Salem and the Gods, and also on a meta level of the writing. I mean, all the characters are victims of these writers, but Ozma specifically. Specifically, and especially. Hardly any real agency, no depth or true convictions, and immense amounts of needless pain, suffering, and trauma in the hopes those alone can give the illusion of a deep, tragic character. And after all of that, they have the nerve to frame him as the bad guy, to have the main characters ridicule, lecture, and beat him, and to have the audience go along with it. And the sad part is, it worked for a lot of people, myself at the time of Lost Fables release included. So a lot of this video has been focused on writing and storytelling and folding in advice for writers within my critiques. That said, understanding and imparting that knowledge is far easier than actually applying it. You can only really learn this through experience by writing on your own time, working on several projects of your own until you feel your skills are polished enough to pull off whatever your ultimate goal is. Which is why I wanted to mention my own book, Disenerabus from the Ashes. Look, I feel weird mentioning it here, but this is what self-promotion entails, oh dear. Anyhow, my debut urban fantasy novel is likewise set in a speculative future version of our own world, following the revelation of magic and sorcerers to humankind, and humans not taking it well and doing what they do best. 
ruining everything. We follow Felix Brasher, an angsty little fire sorcerer who wields both blue flames and repressed trauma from his upbringing, who now struggles with the pursuit of power versus actually understanding why that lust for power exists in the first place. It's a story of magic, friendship, love, deception, trauma, power, bartering with a creepy masked figure who might as well be the devil, and all around chaos. Also, it's very gay. Disenerbus is currently available for pre-order and will be released on November 16th of this year. Sales links will be down in the description, along with a link to videos about the book and the first four chapters over on my fancy author website. I've been crafting this thing for five years at this point, so if you could take the time to check it out, it would be very much appreciated. That said, Amazon is being a bitch when it comes to physical copies. Long story short, I made my physical books through Ingram Spark, and I don't think Amazon liked that very much. So if you would like the physical books, and for whatever reason on whatever Amazon store you use through the link below, they are not available, follow the Barnes and Noble link. Unfortunately, that will only be for US-based people. I, I need to get on this and figure this shit out. Uh, self-publishing is hard. And now, back to tearing apart Ruby. A big part of Remnant's world building is that, well, it's a, it's a remnant, a leftover scrap from the old world which was presumably prosperous and vibrant with magic, before it was abandoned by benevolent gods providing their blessings, a world in which people were happier, less inclined towards sin and malice, and suffering was non-existent, a stark contrast from the world of bloody evolution we are stranded in now. The only issue is... Fuck no, this is not that world! We already mentioned how Ozma dying of a random cold alone is kinda emblematic of this not being a real paradise. And that brings us into the question of the brother gods. Do they suck? Well, in terms of design, yes. Oh my god, their humanoid designs are so boring to behold. I will admit, I do like how the God of Light is an Eastern dragon, since they're considered divine and benevolent, whereas the God of Darkness is a Western dragon, which was considered demonic and malevolent. But beyond that, I hate these fuckers. Granted, I've always had a bit of an anti-authority streak in me, so I'm naturally wary of these gods claiming to have a perfect system so long as everyone does what they say. But if I may be petty for a moment, they're seriously boring though. I hate harping on this, but seriously, one god of light, one god of darkness, that's the most original thing you could come up with. Especially in a series led by four young women where the number four is crucial, in a world supposedly filled with rich fairy tales inspired by every culture of the world over, where we're trying to emphasize that life is more than simple binaries, simple good and evil. All we get is Discount Brothers Grimm? The gods don't even really have their own motivations in The Lost Fable. They just exist to have conflict with Salem and then send Ozma on his way to eternal torment. The God of Darkness was said to hate his brother's creations back in that Volume 4 exposition dump, but why? No clue. He just hates flowers because they're stupid and gay and he made Grimm to trample them. Yeah, the demons that fed off humanity's misery and vice. Their origin is equally boring. As discussed in my Grim video, it's great, go watch it after this one. The God of Darkness here is just some dick who's happy that someone finally asked him nicely for something, only to take it away because he was second choice, and then later exterminate all of mankind because a few angry soldiers showed up on his brother's doorstep. There's no motivation for this. He doesn't even seem to enjoy being wicked for wickedness' sake, like a classic Disney villain. Maleficent would eat this bitch alive, along with everyone else in this cast. Oh dear, what an awkward situation. He's just vaguely jealous of his brother because he's more popular, but he doesn't really do anything about it. His boringness is even the reason why Remnant's moon is shattered. Oh yeah, all those years people spent theorizing on why the moon is the way it is, how it could possibly tie into Salem or the Grimm or even the Silver-Eyed Warriors. Forget all that. It's just because the god of darkness yeeted himself into the moon on the way out. How riveting. It's a lazy and vapid answer that fans had been craving for several years at this point, and equally shallow in its symbolism. Supplemental material tries to say it's symbolic of the folly of man, but we'll discuss in a bit why that's a crock of shit. And again, supplemental shit doesn't count. 
The God of Light, meanwhile, is actually worse than his brother. Honestly, he's to blame for everything wrong in Remnant, but the show frames him as a creator who's being failed by his creations because obviously the Light God Dear Boy must always mean well. If he's supposed to be benevolent, then why doesn't he empathize with Salem and give her the tools to move on? You might say it's not his job, but why would a divine being capable of creating entire worlds be bound by the same earthly limitations as mortals? And the way he engages with his brother in yo-yoing Ozma to and fro death doesn't exactly scream loving God. And when humanity is destroyed, again, it doesn't feel justified because it isn't. It's a relatively tiny army compared to the entirety of the human population, but all of mankind is judged and promptly eradicated because Salem convinced their leaders, who probably weren't even elected by the by, to fight the gods after school. By the old flagpole, shouldn't the extermination of all life be a last resort? Granted, it's the god of darkness who does this, but the god of light doesn't even try to stop him. He just looks away while vaguely sulking. And if these gods are capable of bringing people to and from death, it makes no sense why the god of light couldn't have reversed his brother's actions right then and there. Instead, he just gives up entirely because the actions of a small, very gullible chunk of humans was enough to make him sad. If you look closely, you can see a little dragon tear dripping down the side of his stupid mustache. The God of Light's motivations don't make sense, which is to say he doesn't have one beyond I'm so disappointed in my creations. But he still seems to care, at least enough to revive one dead human and chuck him right back into the hell pit to try and do what he never could have. Unite humanity and teach them to do better. Good luck with that, kiddo. Good luck. Why does he even care? Is he meant to be a good guy? Because his actions certainly don't carry that. Is he meant to be arrogant and incapable of understanding people are complex creatures beyond a good and bad binary? The show doesn't support that either, especially given the silver eye powers of love and compassion come directly from him, rather than these people's own understanding of humanity that he's never been able to grasp. If the silver eye powers are good and they come from this guy, the framing would suggest this guy is good too, which no he ain't. <laughs> Not to mention if he's so kind and generous, why did he create such a bafflingly cruel reincarnation system for Ozma? He says it's so he'll never be alone, but like, was the Avatar ever truly alone despite each incarnation being their own person with their own autonomy? There's no reason it needed to be this cruel a process, robbing each life of their autonomy as they're randomly chosen and slowly absorbed into Ozma's consciousness. Just like the God of Light didn't have to pout while his brother broke the world. We've seen how much this whole process weighs on Ozpin and Oscar, so why would a benevolent god design such a harsh system for no good reason? And the whole humanity will be made whole again thing. What does that even mean? The only tangible difference between old humanity and new humanity besides their origin is that the latter can't perform magic. Big fucking whoop. That magic couldn't stop the common cold from ending the world, so who even cares? Aside from that, there is no difference whatsoever. The only substantive difference is their environment. Old humanity lived in an ostensibly prosperous and peaceful world. New humanity, meanwhile, is essentially stranded in hell, among an endless horde of angry demons with only the bare minimum essentials to protect themselves. The story could easily touch on what it even means to be human, and whether the nature of humanity is good or bad, or whether it can even be categorized either way, given how messy and chaotic life can be. The show's failure with the Grimm ties directly into this. Because they aren't enough of a threat, the audience can't be convinced that life on Remnant is difficult within or without the kingdom's walls, and as such, this claim that humanity's lives as a whole are miserable now without the gods remains baseless. Aura and semblances could have even been brought into this. Again, aura and semblance rules are stupid and dumb and not well explained in the slightest, but there is potential in them as ideas, especially in this new world. All living things have souls and thus presumably have aura. However, semblances don't seem to be a part of the old world. Why? Well, they probably didn't need semblances back then. They all had magic after all, so there was never a need to unlock aura and develop one's semblance the way that people need to now. And semblances are all unique to the individual, all meant to reflect something about who they are. 
in theory at least, so maybe in that uniqueness, those semblances could be seen as a pale imitation of the original magic, they could also be seen as striking, misshapen sparks of that old flame, the remnants of magic in the planet's people, their unwavering wills, and the expression of themselves and their light within even the darkest depths, a beauty that could never have existed without the ugliness of the world they were born into, capturing the duality of life and the paradoxical nature of what it means to be alive. But again, none of that is to be seen. Salem never comments on semblances versus magic. The show never talks about the differences in depth and how the characters interpret them. Hell, it couldn't even be bothered to explain semblances within the show itself without those godforsaken world of remnant shorts until volume five semblance you know like your very own superpower everybody's got one in one of the most blatant as you know bob ways imaginable for those unaware as you know bob refers to a clunky exposition technique where one character explains the world building to another character to give information to the audience when both characters should already know these things to begin with given this is the world they live in the faunus are also an afterthought here which is unsurprising. Supposedly their origin got cut just like the Ozma scene, so we'll likely never really know what their story is beyond emerging from bloody evolution. The fairy tale book talks about all the different faunus creation myths, but I'll repeat myself briefly. That's not what supplemental content is for. Dust isn't explained either, it just briefly makes an appearance in a random marketplace next to the faunus that Ozma walks past. This is especially a fumble given how important Dust was made out to be at the very start of the series, explained in H Bomber Guy's video all about the show. It's great, go watch it. Look, I just love me some good left tube content, okay? If Lindsay and ContraPoints make good content about fake animes, I'd never shut up about them in my videos either. Oh, by the way, go watch Lindsay Ellis and ContraPoints or you're grounded. How am I supposed to explain to my child? Hang your shitty child for all I care. McKaylee will just have to figure out how to navigate a world where the gays are allowed to kiss in public on our own. But people still debate what dust is. Is it the remains of old humanity, making them the equivalent of dinosaurs becoming fossil fuels for us to burn? Is it the fallen chunks of the shattered moon crashing into remnant? Will we explore what these things could mean thematically? You know the drill now, of course not! Even the relics and maidens are complete afterthoughts here. The God of Light just shows silhouettes of them to Ozma and tells him to collect all four to start Judgment Day whenever humanity's ready. They're shallow MacGuffins and nothing else. Their origin, along with that of the vaults as these extra-dimensional holding spaces, isn't even touched upon. The Maidens, likewise, get nothing more than a technical cameo through Ozma and Salem's nameless daughters. Also want to mention that Ozpin mentions in Volume 5 how he created the Maidens by giving them each a share of his magic. I sacrificed a great deal of magic to four young women. They were the first Maidens. <laughs> Yes, I know Oz lies, but given the show never gave us an alternative, the only canonical answer we have to go by is that the God of Light didn't create the Maidens, Ozma did. And he did it at some point between the end of the Lost Fable and the start of the series. I talk more about the Maidens and Relics in my video, The Four Maidens Represent Nothing, but to summarize, yeah, none of it represents anything. It doesn't, it doesn't say anything. They're just shallow MacGuffins to move the plot along and nothing more more illusory storytelling, which Ruby viewers should be accustomed to at this goddamn point. So to summarize what Ozma's been through, he saved a random woman from a random tower and, according to the wiki pages that Jin memorized, fell deeply in love with her, only to die shortly thereafter from a bad head cold. He was then yeeted betwixt the shores of life and death by the ghastly gods themselves, and tasked by a comically oversized golden globe for furries to fix all the world's woes, all while robbing each reincarnation of his new life in Hellworld of their autonomy. All this followed by his now demonic lover ostensibly manipulating him into building her an empire and then slaughtering him and their children, all in front of his eyes as their home burns to ash around them after a brutal off-screen fight for daring to question 
question her, at the end of which he's burned alive and then is reborn to process this through several lifetimes of trauma and alcoholism. But yeah, he did lie about some stuff, so I guess he's the bad guy, right? Yeah, I guess. Sure. All right. This is such a bafflingly stupid reasoning for Ozpin's vilification, both in universe by the characters and on a writing level by the show's framing itself. When someone goes through such a horrific experience, especially at the hands of someone they once loved, they're not exactly going to be over the moon at the thought of sharing that trauma, even with close trusted loved ones, let alone some random school children and their depressed bird uncle. It essentially comes off as, how dare you not tell us all the gory bits of your past in vivid detail, without any compassion or even a twinge of sympathy from any of our supposed heroes. Not an ounce of regret for making Ozma relive something that's probably haunted him for the literal eons he's been trapped here on Remnant. This is likely because the show had tried for years to clue us in on how shady Oz and his inner circle were. What is this? Who are you? You know who we are. Atlas has been studying Aura from a more scientific standpoint, and we believe we found a way to capture it. That's classified. Wrong. And goddamn, do I regret buying into this horse shit and fueling it in my earlier videos. But they really tried to sell us in the idea that Oz wasn't sharing everything, especially with Salem's talk of him using children as disposable shields. And that weird talk in Volume 5 about how awful it is he gave Crow and Raven, who consented, the power to become birds at will. Wow, how awful. Next you'll be telling me he gave Ruby the power to turn into Rose Petal- Wait, no, that's just a semblance she naturally developed, then that's fine, I guess. Magic, semblances, so vastly different. The point is, the show believes Oz is in the wrong for... something. Like the needless suffering that comes with his reincarnation process, it seems the writers want to inject moral grayness into the story, but didn't bother actually thinking through what constructing a morally gray conflict might entail. Instead, they just suggested the idea that Oz has done some fucked up shiznits with nothing to back it up, and then pretend like this huge lore dump where he mostly suffers through events largely out of his own control is evidence of his wickedness. Do you know what this is called? It's called victim blaming. And not gonna lie, Oz is justified in withholding a lot of this information. It's lying by omission, yes, but let's be real. If he told people, they'd all give up immediately and let Salem end the world. Or whatever the hell she wants. Who the f- I, I doubt she even knows. It's likely that Oz's thought process is that putting up a fight against her, even if it lasts forever, is worth giving the majority of people a relatively happier life within the safety of the kingdoms. Again, this is the show forcing me to come up with all this on my own, but even then, I still don't see the awfulness in Oz's lies. If anything, it makes sense why he would act this way. Even if you think he's wrong for lying, he's by no means a villain, nor is he some kind of bloodthirsty monster or malicious liar. But no one even thinks to address the horrifying shit he had to endure. No one asks about his love for Salem, his daughters, or how he dealt with what he'd gone through in the centuries since. Instead, they all just decide to gang up on him and crucify him as an irredeemable, heartless traitor. This could have worked if it was portrayed as a heat-of-the-moment decision while everyone was high on shock and emotions. But you know what usually follows a heat-of-the-moment decision? Regret. Reflection. Oh shit, I just made an awful fucking choice because I let my emotions get the better of me before I could actually think through my options. Literally, none of the characters do that. Not Ruby, not Weiss, not Blake and especially not Yang, for some reason. But these opinions of Oz stick, with them being wary at the thought of his return even two whole volumes later, even after he saves them on several occasions and blows up the witch. Not to mention that they're all okay with the abuse that Crow doles out on Ozpin and by extension Oscar. No one apologizes to either one of them for Crow's actions. Crow himself doesn't really give a shit, and Oscar doesn't clarify whether he felt the pain as Crow punched him. The writers seem to really harp on that conflict of the Oz carnations becoming one, but they seem to have skipped over this bit where Oscar is getting the brunt of the backlash and literal physical pain because of Ozpin's actions. And Oscar doesn't even get apologies from it. It's either lukewarm concern or complete indifference. 
or in John's case, flat out aggression. He's in your head, isn't he? Did you already know about this? He didn't know any of it. How much longer can we even trust him? What if we've been talking to that liar this whole time? John! Also, I don't know if any of y'all have noticed, but the show has a really weird fixation on physically abusing Oscar specifically. He gets beaten by Hazel in their fight in volume five. He's punched by Crow and shoved into a wall by Sean in six. He gets assaulted and left in rough shape by Neo in seven, then promptly shot off a cliff to his near death by Ironwood. And after the Hound makes Oscar his new chew toy in volume eight, he spends most of the volume being brutally tortured by both Salem and Hazel. Like, what the fuck, guys? Again, needless suffering isn't a substitute for actual character writing. Also, not a good look. He's one of the few characters in the show who isn't pale as a corpse, and the only dark-skinned member of either of the main teams. But the mention of the characters' reactions earlier brings me to another point. The cast of Ruby operates on a hive mind. My friend Cinzy directed me to this fantastic Reddit post that I'll share here and link down in the description that points it out. God bless the critics subreddit. I can't believe the main Reddit tried to ban y'all. Like, what the fuck, man? Actually, um, given how they reacted to my recent video after I used to be their favorite, yeah, I can believe it. Oh, I can believe it. So light me up, light me up, light me up, go ahead and light me up. But the gist of it goes that the writers don't think about each character individually, what each of their individual motivations are, what knowledge they're working with compared to others, nor what each of their goals are. Instead, they all operate on the same system, so the writers have the easiest time churning out half-baked scripts. It's part of the reason so much of the story feels illusory. The characters in Ruby aren't true characters, but rather chess pieces to move about the board, with amorphous motivations you can change on the spot, depending on what you need. And unfortunately, the Ruby writers don't know how to play chess, nor use it for effective symbolism when it comes to shock. Yes, I will die bitter that Blake and Weiss didn't take that bastard down together. What the fuck, man? What the fuck? <laughs> But with normal character writing, you would have each character responding to the lost fable differently based on their own experiences and biases. Like, maybe Weiss feels for Salem for being locked away by her, her cruel, cruel father, or Ozma for the abuse that he endured. Maybe Blake is similar on the abuse front, but feels contempt at Ozma for allowing Salem to build such a presumably evil empire that maybe did some fucked up shit to Faunus. Maybe Yang doesn't know how to feel about this and just sees Ozpin as an easy scapegoat and is also fueled on what Raven told her. And maybe Ruby sees the complexities of it all and starts to question her wanting to make the world good when it seems like it's all just far too chaotic to fix. Instead, they all just go, Ozpin is a liar and he sucks, and then just cancel him on Twitter before punching Oscar into a tree. Something I didn't bring up during this, but I find incredibly telling about the effort behind not only The Lost Fable, but the show's recent volumes, is the lack of fights in this chapter. There is not one fight to be found here. Every time one is about to start, we cut away from it. Ozma and Salem escape the fortress? You stills. Salem is about to fight the gods? God of Light eats the camera and we cut to black. Salem versus Ozma? Only show their shadows in the main character's reactions like this is a YouTube reaction video. On a pragmatic level, it was most likely to save on time and budget, but this also speaks to a deeper misunderstanding the writers have towards the roots of their own story. Ruby was initially conceived as a show where fights were fundamental to the formula. That was mostly because Monty was best at making well choreographed, flashy, character-driven fights. But he also understood that fights are a great way at showing your characters two colors in a tough moment and working out a conflict in a fun and flashy way. After all, you can't make a diamond if you don't put it under intense heat and pressure. But while the choreography of the fights may have technically improved in recent volumes, mostly, they still lack the energy and soul of the Beacon era when Monty was still here. The animators do their best, but the writer's inability to understand these characters and write them accordingly seems to translate into how Kruby, on a production and directorial level, handles their fights. They feel like an afterthought devoid of any real emotion or meaning. Instead, fights in modern Ruby feel tacked on, like a mandate to please the fans without thinking as to how they can truly enhance the story. This was especially an issue in Volume 8 in many regards, but it's also a huge problem with Lost Fable. 
Granted, Monty-style fights couldn't save the Beacon volumes given just how disjointed the production process was and how awful the scripts were, but at least back then, they were fun spectacles to revel in out of context. And also, the only place where consistent characterization seemed to appear. There's a reason why people still enjoy the food fight, or the train fights, or Pyrrha vs. Mercury in isolated clips on YouTube, but no one is clamoring to do the same with Blake vs. Ilya, or Cinder vs. Penny. So to recap, The Lost Fable is a shallow, half-hearted mess, and it's the culmination of all the show's writing problems condensed into 26 minutes of vapid or non-existent character motivations, bizarre plot choices, and no emotional resonance whatsoever. On a surface level, it may be an epic tale for the ages, but it's gilded. Scratch the surface even slightly, and you'll immediately see just how shoddy this thing really is. Oh, anyway, <laughs> if you enjoyed that video and would like to see more content like this from me, assuming the Reddit doesn't track me down and murder me, then be sure to subscribe and ring that bell for notifications because YouTube hates creators. And as a gentle reminder, pre-order links for my upcoming novel are in the description below. If you would like to further support myself and the channel beyond just the book, then please consider if you're willing and able pledging your support over on Patreon. I'm the Unicorn of War. Goddamn The Lost Fables is a shit show. <laughs>